Uh, so I'm pleased to introduce our speakers today for the seminar. Uh, we have with us Dr. Adam Clark, a research scientist at the National Severe Storms Laboratory. Adam received his PhD from Iowa State in 2009 and has had an influential career since. Uh, he is one of the lead coordinators for the HWT Spring Forecast Experiments, and his main area of research areas include um, diagnostic, visualization, and verification of convection allowing models. Uh, though I also know he likes to look at the long range models for any hints of a trough swooping through the central plains in the spring, too. So he does look at those long range ones. Uh, we, also, <laughs> we also have with us the relatively newly doctored Eric Loken. Um, he's now a research scientist with the Cooperative Institute for Severe and High Impact Weather Research and Operations. That's a mouthful. Um, his main research areas include machine learning, especially in regards to convection allowing models, along with forecast verification. Um, and then under the astute advising of Adam, Eric joined the DTC as a graduate student visitor for a full year from January of 2019 into early 2020. So just prior to the onset of COVID times. Um, and we thoroughly enjoyed having him spend that year with our group. Uh, and so today we're gonna hear more about the work that Adam and Eric did during that uh, visitor project and what's, what they've been up to since then. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Adam, and just let us know your preference on how you'd like to handle questions. If you want people to raise their hands during the slides or if you'd just like them to type in um, in the chat, we can address them afterwards. So whatever your preference um, is, is totally fine with us. We'll go from there. Okay. I'm not sure I'll be able to see when people have their hands raised. So um, probably best to either put them in the chat or wait to the end. Or if, it, you know, I mean, I don't care if you just butt in, uh, you know, turn your mic on and, and ask. That's fine, too. So um, cool. Uh, okay. So, yeah, I'm actually really thankful that we had the opportunity to um, visit NCAR for that entire year, you know, the timing was great. Of course, we didn't know at the time that we wouldn't have even been able to do a visit like that um, if we would have even done it like a year after. So the, the timing worked out great that it was uh, before the pandemic. And so Eric was there for a year and then I visited for two weeks and Eric and I kind of came up with this project to apply some of the techniques that he had developed um, and I would apply it to warm forecast data, uh, and just a, kind of a proof of concept type thing. And so that's what uh, I'll be talking about is the work that I did as part of uh, Eric and I's visitor program project. Um, so let's see, let me, uh, I have one intro slide. I just want to give some information on warm forecast. I'm not sure if uh, everybody in the audience will know what it is. Um, so the, the main motivation for Warn on Forecast, this is an initiative led by uh, where I work, the National Severe Storms Laboratory, um, to extend warning lead times for severe hazardous weather. Um, so to do this, um, we've developed a convection allowing ensemble system that uh, uses ensemble DA and what makes it really unique from other systems like the HER and the HERE is how it simulates um, and has a rapid cycling of satellite and radar data. And so warning forecast is really meant as um, very, very short-term guidance. So like zero to three hour lead time. So it's like really important to get the initial state right and uh, depict storms um, at the initial state in the model. So to do that, it's really important to assimilate you know, radar and satellite and use um, ensemble DA. So uh, this is just illustrating that, you know, we use numerical guidance for, uh, you know, lead times, you know, beyond the warning lead times. Um, and then for, for shorter term prediction, you know, there's this, you know, warning detection paradigm where we're just using um, you know hazards as they appear on radar or that have been cited by observers uh, everything and so we, we'd like warning forecast to kind of fill this gap between the watch and warning lead times and eventually be used as something to help uh, with warnings and extend warning lead times 
Okay, so the basic idea um, for this project, um, what kind of motivates it. So we're on forecast, I mean, this is still a three kilometer convection allowing ensemble. So it doesn't explicitly predict tornadoes, wind and hail. Uh, so you have to use proxies. And so um, updraft helicity is a really common proxy that's used for uh, severe weather. But if you're gonna use that to derive severe weather probabilities, uh, you have to calibrate it. Um, and this can be, you know, Ryan, I, Ryan Sobash, I saw you were in the audience. Obviously, you have a lot of experience with this. It's not an easy thing to do. The calibration is dependent on what model you're using, the resolution, the time of year, uh, the, the area, the geography, all those things. So, so just calibrating based on these proxies is hard. Uh, the random force are, are ideal for this sort of thing. Uh, they give reliable output even when your predictors are, are biased um, and uh, or like non-linearly related to predictions. So uh, what we set out to do was to, to do something simple. I look at this as like a proof of concept. You know, can we take the one forecast output, uh, feed it into a uh, machine learning algorithm? We use the random forest uh, in this case and get severe weather probabilities in the zero to three um, hour lead time. So, so we took data from May of 2018, and actually there's, a, there's some April and some June data in there too, um, and applied the random forest. We have hourly initializations from 19Z to 2Z for 24 cases. And so the, the number of initializations uh, is 192. So for our severe weather observations, we mapped storm reports to the three kilometer WAFs grids uh, and kind of keeping in line with the SPC definition of severe weather, um, all points within 39 kilometers of a point are considered events. SPC uses 40 kilometers, 39 is nicely divided by the grid spacing. So that's why we use 39 instead of 40. Um, and this map on the right is just showing um, what the reports mapped onto that grid and then dilated to that 39 kilometer radius look like. So the advantages to doing this, uh, the large areas covered by the severe weather OBS um, help mitigate undersampling of observed severe weather. Um, we do sacrifice uh, spatial precision when we do it this way. In some ways, that kind of goes against what we want warning forecasts to do, which is provide these really specific, you know, precise um, predictions of storms. Um, but, you know, we can't have everything always be ideal. Um, you know, ideally, we'd actually have a really thorough, like, three-kilometer grid of observed severe weather, um, but we don't have that. Um, tornadoes and hail, you know, maybe uh, we could come close to it using uh, you know, observations of tornadoes and then uh, radar derived products for hail like the mesh. Um, but wind is a really hard problem. So, so just getting these high resolution grids of observed severe weather is, is a big challenge. Um, you could also train on severe weather warnings. Um, and we had a student that did a project on that, but uh, you know, we just stuck with the, the reports. So this type of thing, I'm not the first uh, to do this. We have a postdoc at NSSL, Monty Flora. Um, his PhD was based on applying machine learning to warrant forecast. And so, um, and he has a, a, a paper that came out in 2021 um, that, that detailed the uh, framework that he came up with. Uh, his method is, is quite a bit different than the one that I came up with. It's uh, event or object based, which means that he's identifying objects uh, or storms in the Warner forecast data. Uh, and then he's uh, using a, a large set of predictors. So attributes of those objects, uh, either that are uh, related to the storms themselves that comprise the object or the environment, um, and using that to predict the probability that a report will be associated with that object. So in my case, it's quite a bit different. 
uh, it's a grid-based framework. That means that I'm just uh, inputting different predictors um, that are gridded, so like the entire grid of the, the warm forecast data, uh, and then using that uh, to have the random forest give me the severe weather probabilities. So um, just going through some of these different comparisons, you know, we both use machine learning. Um, Monty used several different machine learning approaches where I just stuck with the random forest. Um, there are different prediction time windows uh, in our two studies. I'm focused on three hours. Monty only did these 30 minute chunks. Uh, I'm trying to predict all hazards with the algorithm. Monty looked at tornado, wind, and hail separately. Since I'm just looking at uh, one year of cases, uh, predicting all hazards was just uh, helped me with getting a good sample. Um, if I were to just say focus on tornadoes, 2018 was a really big tornado year. So I think I really would have had a hard time getting reliable uh, probabilities with a, with a small sample. So anyway, I won't go through all of these, but um, I thought it was useful just to try to kind of put what I'm doing in the context of uh, some stuff that's already been done. So um, one of the things I wanted to do was, uh, you know, if you're going to create an algorithm to predict severe weather, you should have something to compare it against, some kind of a baseline. Uh, and so to do that, um, this is pretty common uh, in you know, this type of verification. I just used uh, UH uh, to, to derive severe weather probabilities. And so the way to do this is uh, you can experiment with a range of different uh, UH thresholds, and then you smooth the UH field uh, as well. And you can kind of just figure out, okay, what's the best uh, amount of smoothing uh, and the best threshold to use for, for updraft to listing. And for uh, what I did, we found that the 99.8 percentile uh, with a 48 kilometer sigma used in our smoother uh, gave the best Breyer score. Um, and so that's what we derived our severe weather probabilities with uh, for the baseline. So the spatial scale um, that we found, so this uh, smoother, it's a lot smaller than that uh, that's found to be skillful for day one forecasts, which makes sense since you're, um, you know, this is a really short lead time forecast. You expect to be able to issue a more precise forecast. And just to compare to some previous work, um, Sobash at L2016 and Clark at L2018 found that uh, the best sigma um, for their experiments was in the range of like 150 to 180 kilometers. So you had to smooth the heck out of it um, to get uh, a reliable forecast. Okay, so. To implement this algorithm, um, the, the strategy kind of loosely follows that of uh, one of the papers that Eric published from his work uh, at DTC in 2019. Uh, and we use 30 different predictors that are summarized in this table. And so I classified them as environment fields. And for those, I took a mean across all of the worn on forecast members at each hour. So at lead times of one, two, and three. And then I took a mean over each of those lead times. So that gives you one field uh, for each of these uh, in environment fields, like one predictor, I should say, uh, uh, that, that covers the entire grid. The other category would be the hourly maximum storm fields. And for these, uh, I generated three different types of kind of summary measures um, so that we could kind of have a, instead of inputting the individual members, um, we have three different ways to summarize the, the data from all the members. So the first is just the max from any member. So we would take the max. So for example, if we're talking about UH, we take the maximum uh, UH from a member uh, between you know, hour zero and hour three, 
we do that for each of the members and then we take the max across all of the members so we have one field um, and then we could do the same thing except instead of the max we would use the 90th percentile uh, and then the third thing that we did was a smoothed mean of uh and this seems kind of weird um, but I, I thought it was a good idea. Uh, and so basically to compute a smoothed mean of the UH, you're, um, you, you're taking the, the max, you know, across the forecast hours, uh, and then you're taking a mean of the maxes across the members, and then you're applying a smoother to that. So <laughs> essentially, you know, you're, you're incorporating all the members, um, you know, that are used to calculate the mean, and then you're smoothing them. And I look at the smoothing as a way to like account for spatial uncertainty, especially because we know that warning forecast, as is typical of pretty much any convection allowing ensemble, is under dispersive. So I figured that should help uh, help us out a little bit. Um, turns out it did. Uh, and then I just have some miscellaneous uh, predictors. One that I used was the initialization time of the ensemble. And then this last one, I'll talk about it a little bit more um, down the road here. Okay, then these are just some specs for the random forest implementation. Uh, Eric is the one that is really the true expert when it comes to the random forest. Um, and so if you have any questions about the methods, I'll, uh, I'll probably refer you to him. Um, and, and I won't go through all of these except for this last point um, to to apply the random forest we used something called payfold cross validation and in our case we divided the data into six folds um, with 32 cases per fold so this essentially means that we're running the random forest um, six different times each time we do it we use 160 cases for the training and then 32 cases for the the validation um, and so what you do is, you know, each iteration of the random forest, you use a different chunk. And so uh, by the time you've run it six times, um, each sample has been included in that validation data set. Um, and then that's what you use to, to do all of the verification. So hopefully that makes sense. And that's a really, the K-fold cross validation is a, is a very common method um, to deal with kind of limited sample sizes in machine learning studies. Okay, so this is just an example. This shows what the predictors look like. Um, the kind of gray transparent shaded areas shows where the observed storm reports were. So the, um, here, I'll get my little pen here. So this first one, this is that max UH field. Here's the 90th percentile. And this is what that smooth mean looks like um, there in the top right. So, I mean, you can see, it's less noisy than the, the max and the 90th percentile, and you have values that kind of are spread out over areas that are a little bit larger uh, than the max and the 90th. And then at the bottom row there, it's just showing what some of the environmental fields look like. Okay, so, uh, you know, one of the first things I did for the verification is I just uh, computed a reliability diagram over all 192 uh, cases um, for both the baseline and the random forest that uses all the predictors. And so the good news was that it gave me, actually, at least in my opinion, it was surprisingly reliable. The reliability is all the way up to like 35 to 40 percent forecast probabilities um, correspond almost to the exact same observed relative frequency. So they, you know, follow this one one line here. Uh, the baseline reliabilities are actually not bad, um, but the, the random forest definitely is better. And then some bulk uh, skill metrics comparing the random forest to the baseline all found that the, the random for forest performed uh, better and all the differences were statistically significant. So that was good. Um, now, what do these random forest probabilities look like? I mean, that's really important. You know, can they actually be used by a forecaster? Do they give something that looks like it makes sense? So I'm just gonna show some example cases. This is from 
the 19Z initialization of Warren and Forecast on May 1st, 2018. So this is kind of your typical dry lines setup where there was a tornado threat. Initial mode was supercells and you had a transition into uh, a line of storms. So the baseline here is on the left, the random forest uh, is on the right. The first thing that I've noticed, just you know, looking at a ton of these cases, is the random forest uh, gives you uh, much tighter gradients. Um, so you're not actually doing any smoothing to the random forecast field. Um, you, you smooth some of the predictors, but the output that you get isn't smooth, and that means that you can get um, much tighter gradients than you would um, in the baseline, which you do, you know, you have directly apply a smoother to, to the baseline. So like when you have a dry line, if you look at this area right here, um, you see this nice tight gradient, uh, and then the reports are, you know, immediately to the right of that gradient. Um, here in the baseline, you get uh, probabilities that are probably extending west, you know, the dry side of the dry line. Um, and then I'll just, I'll just take this forward so you can see how the probabilities evolve. So this is the 20 is the initialization, the 21, 22. Some things, other things that stick out to me. Um, if Warner Forecast is producing storms and it's in an environment that's favorable to severe weather, um, even if those do storms don't exist <laughs> in reality, the algorithm is not going to recognize that it's a false alarm. So this area over Kansas City, you had one of forecasts producing storms, but they were spurious. And so you're going to get um, probabilities um, that are false alarms from the, the RF algorithm. I can't fix those types of things. Um, the other area up here in Iowa, some of the probabilities from the baseline were lower um, and the random forest was recognizing that they should be a little bit higher up there. Um, as we go through the initializations, you know, you can see um, just, you know, how things evolve. Let me get rid of that. Pen. So this is the last one of the, the night. Um, here's another case. This was the very next day was kind of another um, dry line day, but the threat was focused a little bit more south over Oklahoma. And so uh, I'll go a couple hours into the future here. Oh, the one thing, uh, one of forecast, the initial supercells that developed on this day, um, it was predicting them a little bit further north, like right up in here, um, than where they actually occurred. So again, it's not going to fix, you know, if it's placing storms somewhere, <laughs> random forest can't fix that. Um, but it, it does end up, um, doing a little bit better later on once those storms have become established. Um, the other thing you'll notice this area, you know, up here, there's there's better separation between these two threat areas um, than there are in the baseline forecasts. So, um, so yeah, the another point I wanted to make, so these cases where you get strong supercells, um, you know, and that's your like convective mode, those produce, of course, a lot of updraft to listy. So, since your baseline is based on that field, um, for these types of cases, I found that the baseline looks a lot like the random forest. It's kind of your more atypical events that you get more clear differences between the baseline and the random forest. So I think the next case shows an example of, uh, eh, this isn't the best. This is actually a case where the random forest didn't, well, I, <laughs> Maybe I should let you guys be the judge of whether it performed well or not. But uh, to me, there was a lot of false, false alarm for this case, but it did light up areas um, where you really didn't have anything uh, in the baseline or your, you know, the members weren't quite meeting that threshold that you needed um, to meet to, to light up the probabilities um, in the baseline. So um, you did have this cluster of tornado reports in central Iowa. Um, you can see that uh, in both of the panels there. So, so yeah, I've, I've spent a lot of time just going through all these cases and just looking at them, which, you know, is something <laughs> that everybody should do when they're doing a study like this. Uh,
Okay, here's the, the this Northeast case. This one was kind of interesting because um, it was like a it was a high shear locate event, and it was a very thin line of storms that ended up producing this wide swath of wind reports. So it's the kind of case where you wouldn't expect to get a good signal from the UH, and so the baseline probabilities look terrible, and they don't really light anything up uh, at all. But what was nice to me is that the random forest, you know, you feed all these different predictors and it was able to recognize that, hey, even though the updraft to Listy um, isn't giving you a good signal here, you're gonna have severe weather. And so throughout this event, the random forest was, was lighting up these areas where severe wind occurred uh, in the baseline, which you'd expect. Uh, so this was, this was nice. And oh, the final case, um, this was a case over the kind of the Ohio Valley. Um, <clears throat> and the one area that I kind of noticed here was uh, right up in here where uh, it seemed like you really got a nice uh, forecast out of the random forest where in the baseline you weren't getting anything. So, so that was good. Okay. So I kind of wanted to do two things with this. The first was just, you know, see if uh, we could get the, the random forest to work with the warm forecast data and produce something that looked reasonable. Uh, the second thing I wanted to do was do some experiments where you could kind of see what the impact of different sets of predictors was. Um, and I probably got the idea for doing this from, from Ryan, Ryan Sobash. Because um, I know he did something similar in one of his uh, machine learning studies, and I just thought it was a really neat way to, uh, you know, just look at what exactly, kind of get into the black box of the, the the machine learning stuff. So, so I did these experiments where instead of using all thirty of those predictors, I only used subsets of the predictors to see how well the random forest did. And so the first one, uh, I did one random forest where I only used the storm variables, so all those hourly max storm fields. And then I did one where I only use environment variables uh, and then looked at the performance. And so uh, what I found, <clears throat> the storm only random forest performed way better than the environment only. So this was like, I guess, a good sanity check and and that's the thing that you know convection allowing models give you they give you these explicit forecasts of, of storms so the fact that that was the type of predictor that had the biggest impact uh, it, it kind of matched what i expected um and the degree to which it provided skill actually surprised me a little bit almost you know you compare the skill of the of all 30 predictors um you're almost getting the same level of skill by only including the storm variables. And so to illustrate this, um, I just have these kind of time series of the area under the rock curve and the Briar skill score. Um, so the green line is the storm only, uh, and then the blue line here is the environment only. So it's like a huge difference. And then if you put, um, the full random forest, so the one that uses all 30 predictors in there, you'll see the green and the black are, are really close together. So you're almost, or I guess you could say, almost all of your skill is coming from the storm variables. <clears throat> oh, and this, this was kind of a, a neat thing that I did. So you can also look at what these probabilities look like if you only include uh, the storm and the environment variables as predictors. So, so storm only looks a lot like all 30 predictors, um, but environment only looks like way different. Uh, and the probabilities are a lot less. So there's just kind of like a, a weaker relationship that the random for, forest finds between the environment and the observed severe weather. Um, and what, what you can do to kind of maybe more directly attribute 
you know, what the storm only and the environment only are contributing to the overall probabilities from you know, all 30 predictors, you can just subtract them from the full random forest. So here, this RF minus RF storm only, you're just subtracting those probabilities from each other. And what's left would be what the environment is contributing to the probability. So like the red areas are where you're amplifying the probabilities because of the environment and the blue is, is the opposite. Um, so here where you have RF minus RF environment only, that's where the storm variables are upping your probability. So all the red areas are, are where the storm variables are you know, contributing positively uh, to the probabilities. And it happens to be, uh, at least in a lot of these areas, where you actually had the observed storm. So that's, obviously that's what you want. And as we go through the uh, different initializations, especially at the later times, it's all the red is right over where uh, the observed storms are, you know, showing that you're getting this uh, great contribution from the storm variables. And the environment's just kind of noisy looking, you know, it's not really doing much, helping you much. Okay, so go through that. Oh, and this is the same thing, but for that case over the Northeast. So this was, um, oh, I think this was actually labeled wrong. This is May 4th, um, where this squall line happened over the, the Northeast. This is a little bit different from that previous case because um, if you look um, where all these observed wind reports occurred, you're getting a lot of red um, that corresponds with where the wind reports were. So in this case, um, if you look at these probabilities, it actually looks like the environment's um, helping out in a positive way to the forecast um, that uses all 30 predictors. Um, so, so I think that if, if you were to actually, you know, go through all the cases, you would find that in some cases you get the environment's helping the algorithm, and in some cases maybe it's not helping it that much. Um, so yeah, so you're getting a lot of these reds that correspond with, um, you know, where you have observed storms for both the contributions from the environment and from the storm variables. Okay, so the second experiment that I did was focused on the storm variables, but I uh, focused on the types of the variables. So for example, um, number one here, <clears throat> it only uses the two to five kilometer updraft helicity. Um, oh, and I, I, I don't think I explained very well all the different types of storm variables that I use, but um, I can do that now. So I'm using two to five kilometer updraft helicity, just the maximum updraft speed, that's this UP only, and then UH zero to two, that's a low level um, updraft helicity. And then WZ, that's just the updraft times the relative vorticity at one kilometer. Um, or actually, no, I have that labeled here. That's the zero to two, uh, yeah, vertical vorticity is what that is. Uh, and then I have hail only RF, and hail is just um, an explicit hail size prediction from the hail cast algorithm. And then this WS only is the maximum hourly maximum wind speed at 80 meters um, so if you just use those by themselves in the algorithm the ones that give you the best forecasts are the uh and the maximum updraft speed and specifically the two to five kilometer uh so these are kind of ordered and uh you know from one to six based on those that give the best forecasts so <clears throat> there's not a lot of separation and skill between these though um, or between the, the, the top two UH and the maximum updraft speed. And so this is just showing the scale as a function of the, um, or with, with the different initialization times. And you can see there's not much separation there. <clears throat> and then I include the rest of the, uh, storm variables in there and, and they all perform not quite as well as the, the UH and the updraft there. So. Uh, and then I, the same type, type of plot is uh, before, I'm just showing the 
sets of probabilities um, with the different storm variables. So this top left, this is showing two to five UH only. The, the top middle is only the updraft. So a lot of these look pretty similar to each other. The ones that stick out to me are like, if you just use your 80 kilometer max wind speed, you get all this like false alarm. And so I think it's <clears throat> recognizing that a lot of areas outside of where there are storms, you know, have pretty high wind speeds. So it's just your background environment. Um, and it's, you know, generating probabilities based on that. So not exactly what you want. Um, so you got to use it in conjunction with the other variables. Same thing with this um, zero to two relative uh, vorticity. You know, you're getting areas <coughs> in the environment outside of storms where you have non-zero values and it's, it's lighting those up. So to me, that <coughs> kind of indicates that there's not that as good of a relationship between that variable and some of the others where you're getting these more kind of honed in predictions. Um, and here's the same thing for that, uh, for that Northeast case. So, so yeah, I mean, there's very obvious differences, you know, depending on which uh, set of storm variables you use. So, okay. So finally, the, um, the third experiment, I'm uh, using all of the storm variables, but only specific types. So I, uh, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier, I did um, a max, a 90th percentile, and then I did like the smooth mean uh, for all of the, the storm variables that I used as predictors. And so I, I only used one of those um, for three different sets of random forests. And the one that performed the best was the smooth mean. Uh, and it wasn't like, you know, best by a ton, but it was clearly better than uh, the 90th and the max only. So here are these, again, it's showing the skill um, with the different initialization times. The red is that smooth uh, only random forest, which does almost as good as the random forest with all 30 predictors. Um, so that was kind of interesting to me. I, I think the smoothing, really helps with the, the spatial uncertainty, uh, I think is what's uh, going on. Oh, and the, the last thing I, uh, the last thing that I did, um, so I was like, okay, is there anything else I could do to get this random forest to perform even better? And so I was like, well, what if I use the individual members as predictors and I only input the storm field that was the best. So I used the two to five kilometer updraft helicity. Uh, and then since I know the smoothing really helped, why don't I just smooth the individual, each individual member, um, you know, to help with kind of that the spatial uncertainty uh, and see if that, you know, improves the prediction. Uh, and so the, the result that I got when I did this was really um, good. I was kind of shocked at how well it did. And what was really interesting to me was that you get these really dramatic improvements when you input the individual members and you smooth them uh, for the early initialization. So this shows up in both, you know, the, the Briar skill score and the area under the rock curve. Um, once you get to the later initializations, um, it doesn't really help that much. And so just to see what this looked like, you know, I, uh, you know, plotted the probabilities for this best, this RF best um, for all of the 19Z initializations, and then just kind of picked the ones out that looked like, you know, were the most obvious improvements. Um, and so this was one, May 12th, the, the best one is the one in the middle. And what it does is it, uh, your areas of, of probabilities, it focuses them more, and then you get uh, slightly elevated forecast probabilities too. So if you take the difference, the, the red areas are where the RF best is uh, 
increasing the probabilities and the blue is where it's decreasing them. So it so increases the probabilities right where you want it to, you know, where the storms occur. <laughs> the other case um, that I included here is an example. This is May 15th, 2018. So on the left is the regular RF with the 30 predictors. And then here's <coughs> RF best, you know, which uses those individual members. And it really uh, amplifies the probabilities. And this was like a, another one of these Northeast squall lines. So it amplifies the probabilities um, and it even hones them in more right over the area where uh, you had the, the reports occur. So that was great. And this was the last case. Same type of thing. Probabilities get amplified, you know, right where you want them to. Okay, so so really that's that's it. Uh, storm fields added more skilled in environment fields. Um, two to five UH and max updraft speed are the best storm field predictors. The the smooth mean that I came up with actually works really good. Um, and the best thing that you can do, especially at the earlier initializations, is use the individual members, smooth them, um, and use that as the um, as input into your reinforce. Um, okay, so why do these individual members work really good? Um, kind of our working hypothesis is that during the pre-CI period, there's you know a lot more uncertainty. You haven't had a lot of storms developed yet. So your ensemble summary measures are, are just less effective at characterizing the ensemble member distributions. Um, and so those individual members at those earlier times are providing a lot more um, unique information to the random forest. Once you have storms develop, um, you know, the Warren forecast system, you know, initializes them. And, and so you really like kind of things right away once you have a storm um you know your spread reduces and all the members have that storm and then evolve it and are about in the same place so it's really less effective to input the individual members in that case so to me that makes sense but i'm happy to if anybody else has ideas i'm happy to listen oh and then <clears throat> i always put this at the end of my any talk on machine learning is you know we, we got to be careful and not let the terminator scenario happen where you know, the, the models take over and, and kill us all. So we got to watch out for that. Um, that's it. That's great, Adam. Thank you. Uh, really interesting presentation. And hopefully you can imagine in your mind we are all clapping. Um, so there were a few questions. And I'll okay. be happy to facilitate those. Um, and then those that ask them, feel free to unmute and chime in as well. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want to be able to see. Uh, everybody, so there I stopped sharing. Um, okay. So yeah, the first question was from Morris. Um, does storm only still beat the environment only for the northeast thin convective line? Uh, and then he later said, "Thank you, you answered my question." So I'm not sure if you. This was in relation to experiment uh, one when you were discussing that one. So if there's anything further you'd like to mention on that. Um. Morris seems happy with your response already. So. <laughs> no pressure. Yes, I'm pretty sure it does um, for that Northeast case too. And then another question that Jeff Beck had asked in relation to that experiment as well was, is the contribution for storm versus environment only sensitive to lead time? Yes. Um, so I showed that plot. Actually, the the, oh, to lead time, I was thinking initialization time. I actually don't know because I only looked at um, this zero to three hour lead time. So, um, yeah, and I was just curious if maybe the environmental fields work better for longer lead times, just a hypothesis, but maybe not. No, Jeff, I think that makes sense um, that it would. Yeah. But I, I just haven't you know, looked at it, but sure. I yep. think it might. Lots of, of things to look at with these things. <laughs> yeah. Great, thanks. Uh, the other question that we had was from Dave Ohievich. Um, he asked, is 80 meter AGL wind speed, or he just states 80 meter AGL wind speed was one of the less important storm variables. 
Um, did you also look at the 10 meter wind speed? Was that available? Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's why we looked at the 80 meter because we didn't have the, the 10 meter. Um, in the more recent configurations of warning forecasts, we do output both the 80 meter and the 10 meter. Um, but at the time, I can't remember why we were only outputting the 80 meter. Um, I'm not sure it would really matter that much. Um, 80, you know, the 10 meter is like um, kind of a model diagnostic. You know, you have to like interpolate, um, or there's some you know algorithm where you you're actually just estimating what that 10 meter wind should be. Um, so the the 80 meter makes a little bit more sense because you're more within where the you know vertical levels of the model are. Okay, that's what I thought. All right, and then we had a question come through from Ryan Sobash. Uh, nice talk. It would be cool if the Red and Forest learned the member dependent biases within the mixed physics ensemble. Any chance that's the case when training with all members? Yeah. Um, you know, you would think that it could do that. I don't have any proof that it can. Um, you know, Eric's work, he did he did these experiments where he um, looked at, you know, what was the impact if, but Eric was looking at like the day one time frames, and um, he can probably speak to this more, hopefully I'm getting this right, but basically what you found was that you got better results if you, used the mean fields from href as predictors as opposed to the individual members which we weren't expecting initially we thought okay if you feed it the individual members the the you're going to learn what the individual like biases are and that's going to really help you but it turned out that wasn't the case right eric yeah that's right the only caveat or addition to that is that when we use the ensemble mean fields we use them at multiple spatial points where we only used um the individual member fields at a single point, but we smooth them. But I think it would be like the interpretation is exactly what you said. Yeah. Um, and the the war on forecast members, they they aren't really very diverse. Um, I think the main difference is in the boundary layer schemes that they use. But other than that, like they use the same microphysics, the NIFL microphysics. Um, so in a, you know, in an ensemble that that is maybe more diverse, like the HREF or something, you know, maybe, I mean, that's what Eric looked at, but I still think, you know, it, it should be able to learn the, the biases in those members. And, and Yeah, I was curious about this too. I just, I didn't do anything quantitative. I looked at the, um, the WASP viewer that Brett has on the website for some of the days where um, I think I think Adam uh, picked out where you saw the biggest differences or something. And qualitatively, I couldn't, I was trying to see like, oh, maybe the machine learning is picking up on some sort of initiation bias with one of the members. Qualitatively, I couldn't pick up on it, but maybe if we applied um, some robust interpretability metrics, you know, maybe that would key us in. Maybe it's something that's not obvious to the to the naked eye. But it was it's a fascinating result to me too. Something that I didn't expect. Any, that, that's all the questions we have right now in the chat. If there's any others, feel free to unmute and ask. We, uh, we started, we've been, like our spring forecasting experiments that we do every year now, we have like so much um, machine learning guidance that we're um, looking at now, contributed by, well, like we have NCAR folks, like Ryan contributing, um, and then Eric, the algorithms that he developed as part of the visitor center or visitor program project are being uh, looked at in the forecasting experiments and they have done really, really well. Um, so 
this kind of area of research, I feel like is, um, has a lot of potential, but it's such a, there's so many ways to like configure these algorithms and it's such a new thing, you know, that, I mean, what, what we did, we were just like, ah, this, this is, see if this works. And, you know, there's about a million other ways we could have done it, you know? So it's kind of exciting in that it's like this new frontier and there's just so many different ways to, to do it. When we first started doing it in the test bed, I was really, really skeptical. Um, and a lot of people were actually, but I, I think pretty much now everybody that's been around for a while, um, you know, doing running these experiments is like completely sold on, on this type of thing that it's really, really going to help us. Ryan, wouldn't you agree? Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for the presentation. It was really interesting. We look forward to seeing kind of where this goes and during the test beds this year and, and going forward. So thank you. Um, I guess if there's any other follow-up questions that anybody has, feel free to you know reach out directly to Adam or Eric and I'm sure they'd be happy to address those as well. So really appreciate your time and thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you.